Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Roman Zelesniks will defend the academic thesis Deep Learning in Cardiovascular Imaging Using AI to Improve Risk Predictions and Optimize Clinical Workflow. My name is Nana Defees, as you see on the screen. I'm uh, the Vice Dean for the Faculty of Health Medicine and Life Sciences, and I'm chairing this session. There will be an opposition, but before the opposition, I would like to invite Mr. Zelesnik to give a summary of his work. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Yes, it works good. Um, dear ProRector, dear members of the Corona, dear family members and audience, um, I want to give a, shit introdu a short introduction into my research of this doctor's thesis about deep learning cardiovascular imaging using AI to improve predictions and optimize clinical workflows. Cardiovascular disease is the most common preventable cause of death, death in the Western civilization. And um, although we have effective lifestyle and pharmacological prevention, uh, identifying those who would benefit most remains ongoing, uh, an ongoing challenge. To predict cardiovascular risk, uh, we can use computer tomography or short CT. Um, SCT is a medical imaging technique that delivers detailed images of the body, which can be used for non-invasive diagnostics. Um, on the right on the screen, you can see an example CT showing the chest of a patient. Um, to give you a short overview, um, what we can see here, um, in red, you can see the heart. And in cyan, you can see the lung. And in yellow, you can see the spine. One of the strongest known predictors for cardiovascular events is coronary artery calcification, which can be quantified in CT scans. Uh, in our example image on the right, uh, these orange areas shown, uh, these are showing uh, coronary calcium. So coronary calcium scoring has been recommended by guidelines to risk stratification, uh, specifically in the setting of primary prevention. And um, additionally, showing patients their coronary calcium on an image provides a teachable moment uh, to empower them to make informed and individualized uh, decisions. Uh, it also helps to improve long-term compliance for preventative, uh, preventative uh, therapy and lifestyle changes, uh, for example, that people uh, quit smoking. Uh, while the calcium score is being traditionally measured on special ed cardiac CTs, it can also be measured on nearly every standard CT scan of the chest performed without contest. Uh, however, the measurement uh, requires radiological expertise, time and specialized equipment. And as a result, uh, this essentially free available information is often not reported. With this background in mind, we start a project to, uh, to develop a machine learning system for fully automatic coronary calcium for quantification, which we also published in the link below. And uh, so we developed a machine learning pipeline that first located the heart in a given, in a given CT scan. Uh, in the next step, the system segmented the heart. Then within the heart, the system segmented coronary calcium. And uh, uh, finally, we calculate the coronary artery calcium score. For this project, uh, we are using deep learning, which is a relatively new subgroup of machine learning. And uh, deep learning has had tremendous success in the recent years. It utilizes graphics processing units, uh, or short GPUs, very well, actually. And uh, although they are, were initially developed for computer gamers, they are very well suited for all sorts of imaging processing tasks, including, of course, medical imaging tasks. So in recent studies, deep learning has really shown that it can reach or even surpass uh, human-like performance in specific tasks. To develop an accurate, robust deep learning system for our needs, uh, we need a large training cohort. So we therefore used a large number of high quality CTs from the Framing and Parts study. This is a community study, including individuals from the general population, uh, healthy and not healthy. Additionally, we had manual heart and coronary calcium segmentation from experienced medical experts. 
A special focus of our study was to show generalizability and real-world applicability of our developed system. We therefore tested it on over 20,000 CT scans uh, from four independent and distinct uh, clinical studies. So these uh, included data from the Framing Hub study, which we chose in the, um, where we chose individuals from uh, different from the uh, training data. We furthermore used CT scans from the National Lung Screening Trial, which included healthy individuals, which were or are heavy smokers. And we also had two symptomatic cohorts from two clinical studies, which included stable and unstable chest pain patients. To show the performance of our system, we did a survivor analysis as well as an agreement analysis. So for the survivor analysis, we stratified the predicted coronary risk score into four risks, uh, risk groups from very low to low, moderate, and high. Uh, we then plotted the survivor curve, uh, which we show in this uh, figure. And uh, I'm going to show the, here the results for the um, cohort of the National Lung Screening Trial. On the vertical axis, we can see the survival rate, and uh, on the horizontal axis, we can see the timeline in years, with a maximum for about 6.5 years. So in blue, you can see the survival curve for individuals with a very low coronary risk. And as you can see at the beginning, um, uh, here at the beginning, uh, everybody is alive, and then over the time, over 6.5 years, if only a few people um, uh, did die. So in orange now, uh, you can see uh, individuals of uh, the low coronary risk score group, and we can easily see the survival rate is lower for these individuals. In green, we can see individuals from the moderate risk group, and then in red, the high risk group. As we can see here very well, individuals from the high risk groups have a lower survival rate. Um, on, and additionally, all four risk groups were also statistically significantly different. Um, the survivor curves for the other tests cohorts uh, look basically similar, so I'll skip them here. Uh, for the agreement analysis, we compared uh, the predicted with the manually calculated risk scores from medical experts. For therefore, we had a subcohort of over 5,500 uh, 500 subjects from all uh, testing cohorts, and we can see a high concordance between automatic and manual risk scores. As the figure shows, our deep learning system predicted for the vast majority of the cases the same risk score as humans did, and uh, difference were often or mostly only uh, on by one risk class, and only very few of those were present. Uh, with this study, we showed that deep learning can fully automatically predict coronary calcium risk scores from almost any non contrast enhanced CD. The predicted risk score is a strong predictor of cardiovascular events, and uh, it shows high correlation with manual quantification. Uh, I also want to present a second project, which is from a different department, is uh, from the radiation oncology and radiotherapy planning department, but it's still a cardiac-related uh, 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 project. So in this uh, study, we were looking at breast cancer patients, and uh, breast cancer is the leading type of cancer in women worldwide, accounting for 25% of all cases. The survival rate is generally high, um, mostly due to early detection and treatment, which includes surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. Uh, when applying radiation therapy, it is of great importance to keep radiation of adjacent organs like the heart low, to not harm the generally favorable outcomes of these patients. Um, this is of particular interest for breast cancer patients as the heart and its substructures are in very close proximity to the radiation target area. In this city, um, we can see um, a breast cancer patient. We can see that the tumor, which is uh, segmented in blue and the radiation target are in pink. And uh, the heart is also shown in red and we can see that uh, the heart is very close to the radiation area. So um, a very accurate heart segmentation is, is important for uh, a, um, a successful radiation treatment. When planning radiotherapy, uh, medical experts manually segment the tumors and the target area and surrounding organs. 
This is a time-consuming task uh, that requires special expertise, and there's always a trade-off between um, segmentation time and segmentation accuracy. So the goal of the study was then to use our hard segmentation model, which uh, we uh, developed from the, in the previous study, and further improve it to segment the heart with high accuracy in chest CDs from radiotherapy planning. Uh, we started again with data from the collaboration with the cardiovascular imaging radiology group, and we added uh, way more training data now, and also um, uh, we refined the deep learning code and trained a uh, completely new deep learning model, basically. <clears throat> We then applied the model to cases from the radiation oncology department um, uh, from our hospitals. So in, we did two studies and in our first validation, we had eight experienced medical experts segment uh, 20 breast cancer patients using their normal equipment in, a, in their normal work environment. After several weeks, we asked these experts to segment the patients again, but this time we provided them with the automatic heart segmentation. So they did not need to segment the full heart anymore, but only to refine the automatic segmentation. We then compared the two segmentation sessions and we found that with our automatic heart segmentation, the segmentation time for the heart decreased from four minutes to two minutes. Furthermore, segmentation agreement between the eight medical experts increased significantly with the deep learning segmentation. For this evaluation, we used the dice coefficient, um, that's a similarity coefficient, with, um, where we can show that with deep learning segmentation, agreement incre uh, increased from uh, a dice of 0.95 to 0.97. And uh, finally, we are, finally, we also compared the heart segmentation from the eight medical experts to a trained radiologist who provided us with manual segmentations done um, this time in an ideal setting with unlimited time to achieve the best possible segmentation accuracy. Our study showed that although um, segmentation time improved by 50%, segmentation accuracy with deep learning segmentation was still as high as the original manual segmentations. We also applied our heart segmentation to a system of 2,800 breast cancer CTs from the radiotherapy treatment plans from our institute. Um, with patients from uh, 2016 to 2018, and compare them to, a a, to the approved manual segmentations. Overall, uh, our analysis showed that the deep learning system had a higher segmentation accuracy compared to the manual segmentations with um, less negative outliers. Finally, I also want to highlight the scientific and societal impact of the studies of my doctoral thesis. Um, in our project, it was important for me and for the whole team to test our methods in independent, large, and distinct data sets to show robustness and gener generalizability um, of our models. And um, we also made our code and the trained models open source and publicly available to hopefully support uh, further research in these areas and maybe even uh, accelerate clinical adoption for these new methods. In summary, uh, we have shown that deep learning can assist, improve, accelerate, and even monitor clinical tasks. And uh, finally, I'm also very happy to share with you that uh, the heart segmentation model is already part of the clinical trial at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, um, where it assists radiotherapy planners with their daily routine. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll give back the Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you also for stopping the screen sharing. Uh, the opposition, opposition sorry, will be opened by Professor André Decker. He's a professor of clinical data science at our university here in Maastricht. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Paul Rector. Um, dear candidate, let me uh, first congratulate you on a, on a wonderful thesis. I enjoyed it very much um, in preparing for this uh, defense, in reading it and assessing it and also congratulate your promoter and co-promoter on this great work. I would like to, uh, given my background, like to talk to you about applications of your work, not so much in cardiology, but in radiation oncology, right? As you um, ended your presentation, <clears throat> you've shown that um, at the Dana-Farber, they're using it now for, um, for delineation of the heart, for instance. 
Um, so my first question is one of generalizability. Um, if I would if I would download your heart segmentation model and just throw it at our packs, right, of the last uh, 20 years, uh, would that work? Um, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I can't, uh, of course, I cannot guarantee it, but I would say 99% yes. So we have tested this model now in, I think, eight different cohorts in, from our study. And then we have now two other groups from Australia and from Europe uh, also using it. So the heart segmentation model, as long as this is um, non-contrast enhanced CT scans, the heart segmentation model will work, yes. Okay. And so, but if I think about whole heart segmentation, obviously the mean heart dose is one of the parameters that we look at in, uh, in oncology, right, of the thorax, both in breast cancer and in uh, esophagus and, and lung. Uh, also, the heart distance that we are uh, irradiating, um, that's uh, the, the maximum heart distance. These are parameters that you could um, use your delineation for. But I think the trend is towards looking at more specific areas of the heart, especially it has been identified that the base of the heart, right, where the um, coronary arteries um, start, that that is, and, and also the AV nodes, there's a discussion there, um, um, that that is actually the region that we should look at in terms of radiation damage. Um, how difficult do you think would it be to, to rather than doing the whole heart uh, delineating using deep learning for all these substructures? What's the challenge there? Um, thank you very much for the question. That's actually um, um, a, a topic we are already looking into. The main problem with non-contrast enhanced scans is that uh, the hard substructures are not always completely visible. Um, and a human brain and the human uh, trained radiologist or medical expert can see from different uh, slides, uh, uh, slices in the, in the CT can basically uh, interpolate between the slices, even if, if at some regions um, we cannot, for example, see the art ar arteries, uh, a human knows where they are and then uh, segment it. And our current deep learning model as it is implemented right now, would not be able to do that. We tested it and um, it works very well on contrast enhanced scans because the, the structures are very well uh, seen there. Mm -hmm. But in non-contrast enhanced scans, it is not. What we are working right now is um, that we are using deep learning to segment the heart uh, in our study, what we are trying now. So we segment the heart first, the whole heart volume, and then we place the... Um, we, we, we place an artificial heart on top of this heart with all the substructures. And then we use basically deep learning to only refine these uh, predefined areas and, and move them to the, to the, um, to the uh, CT right. scan of the patient. In that case, you would still be able to use a non-contrast enhanced CT uh, to, to delineate the substructures, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> now, um, the, in, in general, your work uh, talks uh, about the whole heart, right, and the whole heart volume, but also uh, coronary calcification and, um, and also uh, about uh, fatty tissue, right, around the, the heart, adipose tissue. Um, and you, you have dealt with this in, in separate chapters, right, each predicting uh, one of the outcomes. Now, if I want to build a prediction model for, for instance, um, <clears throat> lung cancer outcomes, then one of the consider one of the concerns in lung cancer is that um, we already we create too much cardiac toxicity, right? Mm -hmm. And so we want to um, exclude those patients that have a high risk of cardiac toxicity, or we might want to reduce the dose to the base of the heart to sort of suffer, right? Now, do you see? that it is possible to start combining stuff here, right? Rather than doing individual, having an AI learn all those different components and trying to get to a, to a let's say, an image-based composite risk score. And what do you see as challenges there? Um, thank you very much for the question. Yes. Um, this is definitely one of the problems we are currently facing that our, or that a lot of the deep learning studies published that they are always focusing on, on a single uh, problem. 
Um, but there is also a trend now trying to predict several different uh, things at the same time. What we are currently doing um, for these problems is that we have separate networks for each program. And then at the end, we have um, another network that combines these problems. Or what we can do is also that we combine all these several networks and the last one into one big model. But still, there is uh, right now, there is a pipeline normally for, for each problem itself. And there is always a trade-off between when to separate models. Um, and, and yeah, sorry. Because there is a stream in AI, as you, as you know, that, that, that really does, uh, I guess, the first thing that you said, right? focus on one task, right? Learn mm -hmm. one thing. And then, um, and, and the benefit of doing that is that each of the individual networks can be, as you've done in your thesis, can be <clears throat> evaluated in terms of do they, are they accurate or not, right? Mm -hmm. And also there's a, there's quite clear in all of your chapters, which I like, mechanistic explanation behind it, right? You're looking for a calcification or you're looking for something that make, or a whole heart volume that makes sense to the, um, to the clinician. So do you agree with me that perhaps the better approach is indeed to stick to these individual things that you can, um, that you can learn and then combine them in perhaps quite a simple model, right? Together with clinical parameters like, I don't know, smoking and, um, mm -hmm. and the hypertension and other uh, cardiovascular risk factors that you can't see on an image, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that will, in terms of a clinical application, is better than trying to you know, pump everything into a big network and, and, and predict your way out of it. What do you feel about that? Um, yes, I would definitely agree. Also because um, we would get these intermediate results from each of the single networks. And then um, we could um, just, um, you know, um, uh, understand better what the last network is doing. Or so, so we would have these individual decisions and then we can see, okay, because of these decisions, the last or the, the overall decision was was made. Um, while if we have one big network for everything together, in the end, we just basically get one uh, result. And it's even more complicated to understand what the network did. So with these intermediate steps, I think it's easier to, um, or better or clearer to understand what the, the whole system basically did. So yes, I would definitely agree with that, yeah. Right. Um... Let me try and 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 get your help on a problem that we are facing um, uh, as well in radiation oncology, which is <clears throat> radiation pneumonitis. Radiation pneumonitis is a is a is a toxicity of of lung irradiation mm -hmm. uh, that uh, can be quite serious, uh, even deadly. And so that's a concern that, <clears throat> besides cardiac toxicity, lung toxicity is one of our main concerns. Um, now. There is, um, apparently, it is the case that um, if you have a cardiac comorbidity, uh, your lung toxicity, you're more at risk of lung toxicity. Mm -hmm. Could you help me design a study using your work that could you know, investigate what exactly is causing what here and uh, trying to identify a mechanistic explanation for this at the moment on um, unexplained phenomena. Um, okay. Um, that's a tough one. So, yeah, maybe I think I would really use separate networks first um, to... Uh, yeah, to, to segment the, the different areas. And then we could have a bigger network where we can have um, a prediction network, which we feed basically with the segmentations, but also with um, different uh, other paramet parameters of, of the study. And then hopefully we can, uh, you know, predict which of the patients should get which treatment. I think the main problem there would be um, to understand why the network made a decision. Right, and, uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's a spatial um, problem that we don't know how to solve. We don't know which part of the heart is causing this. 
Mm -hmm. I agree with you that that is probably the right approach. Given time, I give the word back to the pro vector for the other questions. Thank, Thank you. you. I understand that when we bring those two great minds together, there will be a solution to this problem. Um, I now give the floor to a guest from another university, it's Dr. Bram van Ginneken. He's a professor of medical image analysis uh, at Radboud University and Medical Center in Nijmegen. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, dear candidate, congratulations with a, a very impressive thesis. Um, okay. Also, congratulations to all your uh, supervising team. I also like the cover of your thesis. The, the robot looks, uh, looks very intelligent, but yes. uh, the, the radiology images are really old fashioned. Do you know why? Uh, well, on one hand, a uh, dear, highly esteemed opponent. Uh, of course, it's, it's old fashioned because it, it's, um, basically uh, an analog image, which is printed and then on, on a war. So it's not on a computer screen. So these days, uh, basically nobody is looking at uh, this, uh, the slices next to each exactly. other. Exactly. I mean, in movies uh, and on stock photos, you still see light boxes and yes. films and uh, <laughs> seems like we're still 20 years ago. But uh, yeah, this was just uh, not a serious question, of course. I would like to discuss you with you your chapter two. Mm -hmm. um, you have worked on automated calcium scoring and on contrast CT. Um, and we've also worked on that uh, uh, problem for quite a while. And I would like to pick your brain on, on your experiences. So one of the things that was really difficult for us was to get this automated calcium scoring correct on cases with heart reconstruction kernels as opposed to soft kernels. So did mm -hmm. you also experience that? And, and do you have some suggestions there? Um, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you very much for the question. That's actually a really good question. Um, so for our first tests, we did not have the problem because our training set and the test sets, we always had um, soft kernels. And um, also for our big, the lung screening uh, study, we picked um, the soft kernel over the hard kernel. Yeah. What we but what we saw is um, is that um, for the NLST cases where we did not have uh, soft kernel reconstructions, um, the hard kernel reconstruction still did work. Luckily, so we were happy that that worked. And um, I think one uh, important thing what we had was that uh, we had a a very large number of high quality input scans. And um, we we um, we experimented a little bit with the input data, and we found that um, so we tried to to include low quality images as well in 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 hope that the the network uh, generalizes more than um, than without these these uh, lower quality cases. But uh, interestingly, the at least for our network, the UNet, it performed worse afterwards. So what we found for us is um, the training data is really important that it's the best data possible, the best segmentation possible, and also the best images possible. And then um, what we did is we instead changed the network itself a little bit in, in, in that, that we um, included um, some dropout layers and, uh, and also trained it just for, for a longer period. So we reached, for example, a very high dice in our training code very early, like 95 or so. And then if we trained it for three consecutive days, we could reach a 96 or 97 even. And uh, these last 2%, basically, um, they, don't, uh, they didn't sound much, but they gave us, uh, in my opinion, exactly this, um, the confidence for the network and also the, the generalizability of the network. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. That, that's an interesting observation. Um, on page 29 of your thesis, you, you have a heading technical evaluation, and you say that you have looked at the errors that the network uh, makes by looking mm -hmm. at cases where the computer score and the human expert score deviated a lot. Mm -hmm. you, you refer to a figure that's unfortunately not in your thesis, but I looked it up in the supplements of the original article. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then we do see that uh, in some cases, the deep learning methods makes 
mistakes that a, that a human expert really wouldn't make. So like yes. really stupid mistakes. And I think this is a big issue when we would move towards clinical application of these uh, methods that yeah, human experts will say this is unacceptable if the method makes these mm -hmm. obvious mistakes. I, I cannot trust it. Um, and you can debate whether that, that's a valid argument or not. But I would like to hear from you what, what kind of sort of serious mistakes did the network make? And do you have suggestions how to further improve uh, your system so that it wouldn't make those mistakes? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So one of the, the errors that, uh, uh, that we showed in, in these images is that, for example, if there is a calcium plaque, the network uh, in, in one of these cases uh, segmented only half of the plaque. So half of it was segmented and the rest of it was not. And this is definitely something a human would absolutely not do. And the reason for that is um, for the uh, calcium segmentation model, we divided the hard volume in smaller substructures um, in very small cubes, basically. And then within these cubes, we segmented the calcium. And uh, this case where the half of the calcium was segmented and the other half was not was that um, the plaque was exactly on the border of two, two cubes. And in one cube, the network segmented it, and the other cube, it did not segment it. Um, one way around this would be that um, we have in our test set an overlap of cubes, and then calculate basically the mean of the results of the, of the segmentation. So this is definitely an error that um, could be avoided um, easily, basically. Um, which uh, we chose not to do because we were afraid that um, basically we tried to, to avoid as much um, uh, post-processing as possible and really show the raw performance of the network. Um, because I think this is um, basically the thing that um, the people are really are, uh, medical experts always are really interested in really to see, okay, how does the model perform? And then if we would uh, go to implement our system to the clinics into a practical system, then we can still add these, these post-processing uh, tasks or steps. Uh, you also showed some cases with mitral valve calcification being mistaken for coronary calcification, something with a yeah. pacemaker. How would you solve that? Just add more training data or? Um, yes, so what we are, and another study what we could do is um, uh, we could try to implement a network that, uh, that has a very different approach. So for example, right now oh, we, yeah. are, uh, we, we have a segmentation network that segments the calcium. And um, a, a completely different approach would be that um, we threshold the image first and um, then for every um, plaque basically if we threshold is for calcium um, then we can train a network that basically takes every calcium plaque and uh, decides if it's coronary calcium or not so this would be a completely different approach and then we could try to combine uh, the output of these very different approaches um, combine them together and then um, uh, yeah, calculate one result. And what we could uh, do there is that, for example, if we see um, in a few cases um, that these networks are very uh, producing very different results, that we could then say basically to, to um, a medical expert, attention, um, in these cases, um, the automatic system failed. Uh, please uh, check um, uh, the, the results. So this yeah. could be one one workaround for for these cases. That that's a good suggestion. Do I have time for one more question? Well, maybe we can get back to you later if needed. That's yeah? it. Uh, thank you very much for your answers. I give the word back to the pro rector. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Trinica. I now turn to Professor Elina Koi. She is a professor of medical physics, especially vascular imaging, at our university uh, here in Maastricht. Thank you so much, uh, dear candidate. I would also like to congratulate you with your uh, fantastic thesis. And I was very impressed by the large amount of data that you used and your uh, validation in, in um, independent data sets. And also I think your open source strategy is very important for clinical translation. And also congratulations with your publications in uh, 
prestigious uh, journals. Thank you. Um, so I would like to discuss uh, first uh, your approach, yeah, because you have chosen for an approach where you focus mainly on um, volumetric measures, such as um, the size of the heart and calcification scores that can only also be obtained by human observers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the human observers, of course, they, they need much more time. It's very labor intensive. But basically, uh, you kind of approach a human. And uh, then also, of course, uh, if you look at risk certification, you find similar uh, findings as a human could do, although, of course, much more time efficient. Um, so I was wondering, uh, have you really fully exploited the potential benefit of artificial uh, intelligence or could you also extract information from images that may not be observed by human observers? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for this uh, question. That's actually a really good question I'm very interested in. And uh, I totally agree with you that yes, we, um, we model human behavior. Uh, and no, we did not. Um, um, maybe get the full potential of artificial intelligence yet. And the reason for that is, so we did this on purpose, mainly to try to make it understandable what the network does. Mm -hmm. Because it, um, deep learning has the big challenge that, um, although it is very intelligent, let's say, or it can train a lot of very um, complicated tasks, we have more or less no idea why it is doing this. And that's because of the depth of mm -hmm. the network and the big, um, the, the high number of features it trains. So what we really tried is to to um, to mimic human processes, basically in all of our studies, um, to hopefully um, make it um, accessible or that that humans can mm -hmm. trust or or easier easier find trust in in the in the networks. Um, on the other side, what we are also already doing is um, uh, we try to predict, for example, mortality from uh, CT scans or also from X-rays. Mm -hmm. We try to predict it um, directly and um, that works. But here um, we really have the problem that we uh, basically struggle to, to find the reason why it does it work. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something, for example, if we show a patient an X-ray, uh, or we, we get an x-ray from a patient and tell him, well, your risk score is really high. And then the patient, of course, will ask, yeah, why? Or what should I do? Mm -hmm. And right now we, we are having the problem that we could not uh, uh, explain easily why, um, mm -hmm. um, why this would happen. Yeah, so basically you say deep learning is still a black box. Yes. And th that's why we try to mimic a, a human, um, yeah, but are there still options to open this black box or do you think it's, it's uh, closed? So yeah, so there, there are definitely uh, studies trying to to uh, explain why this, uh, why uh, decisions are made by, by models. Um, for example, we can have um, uh, uh, decision maps, which is basically a heat map. For example, if we take the x-ray um, image again, we can show the areas which were um, highly weighted by the by the network um, for the decision it made. And then there are cases, for example, uh, which was interesting for, I think, um, uh, I think it was for breast cancer, that we could see that the breast area was uh, always uh, highlighted. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, because the, the network more or less only predicted a female or male for breast cancer, because for breast cancer, it's... Um, it's already a good uh, a predictor if you can predict male or female. So in these cases, we could see, okay, the, the, the network just focused on the breast area, decided it's a female, great. Um, um, but there are also cases, for example, if we only uh, included uh, female X-rays, then there are a lot of uh, images where we have more or less not really heat areas where you can say, okay, the network focused on this area or not. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was really not really, uh, we couldn't really um, make a decision why. Uh, right. The, yeah. Yeah, but so there are still uh, a lot of options for the future then for even Absolutely, better. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Pattern. Yeah, and, and another thing I was wondering, because you use data of uh, large population studies, large cohort studies, uh, using CT, CT images that were obtained more than a decade ago. Mm -hmm. But since then, there has been tremendous uh, progression in... Um, 
CT scan uh, quality. And there are a lot of new uh, imaging techniques available as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, what do you think uh, we should focus on in the future? Should we focus on calcium score or do you think there are uh, better options? Um, well, um, so that's that's quite interesting. So what we what we did is, um, for example, uh, for for the calcium study, is we we had a training set and a testing set from the framing and heart study, and how we chose them was that we had basically the first cycle and the second cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had older images and newer images, and um, at the beginning we thought we try. Um, training with the newer images and apply it to the older images. And um, uh, we thought it works better, but actually it was the other way around. We trained on the older network, uh, the older images, and then mm -hmm. applied it on the new images and it worked better there. Yeah. Um, so what we saw there is that if as long as the quality of the images gets better, uh, that shouldn't be a problem because if the network yeah, works... Yeah, if, if I may interrupt you, that I think that is because you focused on like calcification score, size of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, I think nowadays we can also look at different uh, features like perfusion, scar mm -hmm. tissue, wool motion. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, yes, that's what we are trying to do as well, even uh, in the lung screening trial. Um, the network then... So the problem there is that the network then gets really, really deep. And then even uh, though we have large amounts of data, like 15,000 cases, it seems that this is not enough data to train such a deep network. So um, the heart and, and the calcium score seem to be the maximum size we can train a network on with the data we have available. Um, so for example, we, we, we tried to do a prediction of mortality in x-rays. And there we had about 100,000 cases. And it worked in an x-ray, but it's a 2D image. Then we thought, OK, let's try it on a 3D image, because on a CT image, because there's way more information there. Um, but uh, we, we weren't able to, to really be predictive or highly predictive, let's say. So I think uh, it would be great to do so. And I think we are getting there. Um, mainly because um, a lot uh, a lot has changed already or in, or in the near past that more and more data is, is gathered, especially um, because we know now we have these new techniques and the hospitals, we can see that um, they gather more and more data. And also when, you, when we look at the publications, we can see that the test sets and also the training sets, they are keeping increasing. So I think, yes, we are getting there. But I think it needs a little bit more time to um, to get there. Yeah, thank you so much. I think for time's sake, uh, we have to move on. But thank I'm you. very satisfied with your answer. Thank you. Indeed, Indeed. thank you, Professor Sorian. I turn to Professor Maasen. Jos Maasen, he's a professor of cardiothoracic surgery at our university. Please unmute the... Uh, Mr. Pro Rector. Dear candidates, also my congratulations and congratulations to your uh, team. I read your thesis with uh, growing enthusiasm. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon and risk factors are very important uh, for our patients, especially if you can obtain them easily from uh, routine CT scans. And also protecting the heart by uh, proper segmentation is, of course, for us uh, very important. And it's also nice to see that large databases, and we have a lot of large databases because we have uh, registries, national and international, that they can help to, uh, to educate uh, your, uh, your systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a CT fan, and perhaps you can see that in my office there is even a painting of a CT uh, scan. And uh, that's also the reason why I want to uh, go to chapter six with you for a couple of uh, questions. And uh, already in the first sentence, I have a, a problem because I see uh, the word algorithm and artificial intelligence. 
And as a physician, I always thought that an algorithm is a fixed set of calculations that gives you all uh, always the same output if the input is the same and that artificial intelligence is something beyond that. So it's more an autonomous uh, thing and you never know what the outcome will be. Can you help me out? <laughs> Uh, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I agree that the wording there is not perfect, yes. Um, so we, in general, when we published our, um, our study, we struggled a little bit on how we core what we did there. Um, so first, we tried to call it a deep learning model, which is not really correct because we had several steps, including several deep learning models. So we then switched to um, the deep learning system. We named it deep learning system, which combines uh, several models. Um, and then why we used algorithm there, I think we used it more in the sense of uh, a computer generated function more or less. But um, yeah, I would agree that um, the, the wording is, is, is not ideal, no. But as I understand you well, it is an autonomous system. Mm -hmm. So it's the deep learning is not only involved in the training, but is also involved in the decision making. Uh, Well, it is involved in the decision making for the segmentation, but not for further uh, uh, decisions based on the segmentation. Okay. We will come back to it uh, later. Mm -hmm. um, here in Maastricht, we are an expert center for uh, tumors in the mediastinum. And uh, you looked at breast uh, cancer. Uh, so I wondered whether uh, the segmentation of the heart also would work in case of intrathoracic tumors, so mediastinal tumors, because then uh, the distance between the tumor and heart is even uh, smaller because the tumors are actually on top of the heart. Mm -hmm. The benefit would be greater, but perhaps could be also more difficult for the system. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um... I think with our current system or our current system would have a problem with that, mm -hmm. um, mainly because we did not have any of these cases in the training set. Mm -hmm. ah. So um, it would be hard for me to say if it works or not. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I may um, have another example from, uh, for example, if we, we, we try to predict lung cancer, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And there, there could be that, for example, a tumor is within somewhere in the middle of the lung, um, which is for it's quite easy for a network to segment. But or the tumor could also be on the on the border of the lung, and these are the cases where it gets really really challenging for the network. And um, I'm afraid that this would be the same for for um, uh, tumors uh, in close area to the to the heart as well. Mm -hmm. So this... I came to the side to interrupt you. I came to that by the uh, by figure four mm -hmm. represents uh, some pictures of CTs, and they are uh, representative examples. But but actually, they look terrible. Don't you think so? Because um, I wondered whether this this evaluation did not only test your system, but it tests more the quality of uh, of the dosimetrists who judged the pictures, because all, what we see here is all uh, the, the cyan ones mm -hmm. are almost all wrong, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the the, um, the uh, your system your algorithm makes a mistake uh, when there is more than only uh, the the normal contour of the heart. For instance, yes. in the middle lower panel, it's pacemaker leads, and uh, in the right uh, panel, it's something in the lung. Huh? Yeah, 
Um, yes. So with uh, um, with a pacemaker or a stance or any any hard, um, uh, metal artifacts, the network definitely has a problem. Yes, mm -hmm. because there um, the boundaries of the heart are mm -hmm. because of these artifacts not not really visible anymore. Mm -hmm. And then a human uh, 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 planner can uh, again interpolate and know where the border will be. The network definitely cannot do that. Uh, what we did in these cases for uh, for the trial now is, um, first of all, we 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 tell the the users that they are not uh, allowed to use our system on pacemaker patients, mm -hmm. but also we have a pacemaker uh, detection. Um, in, in in that way that we just uh, threshold the image, and if 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 the Hansfield units exceed two thousand, for example, then we know there is there has to be a metal artifact, so we get it out. Um, the cases uh, you mentioned where the the human uh, planner really made an error. Yes, these are errors, but um, we have to be careful first. These are the two outliers, or these are two of the outliers of. In total, five thousand cases we had. So um, these cases show yes, humans can make errors, uh, and they they do. That there's uh, no way around it. But also because uh, one of at least one of these errors was so big, we think that actually there was a mistake when the segmentation was safe. So uh, we think that the planet um, segmented part of the heart. Then saved the day, uh, the the result. Maybe had to go to see another patient or so. Came back and segmented the rest, and then uh, saved it again. And maybe saved uh, a new uh, segmentation. And we we got here from our PAC system the old segmentation. Something like that could have been the problem there because the these are really big problems. Yeah, these these are big errors. Um, but yes, thank you. So time is up. Uh... One more question. Yeah. Uh, let's say I want to uh, introduce this system in my hospital. Um, then the first uh, question would be, should this uh, be considered as a medical device according to the new device regulation in the European Union? A short answer, please, to this last question. Uh... Yes, I would say yes as a new device because uh, I mean it, it's not a device per se, but I think the importance of the result of the network, if we want to use it for decision making, is is so high that I would say yes, we should treat it as an as a, uh, a separate device. Thank you yeah. for your answers, and I give the word back to the program. Thank you. Yep. We'll turn to Dr. Viro Nissen. He's a professor in biomedical image analysis. As you can see uh, from the highlights of the, beautiful, of the beautiful architecture in Rotterdam, he's at Erasmus Medical Center and also at the Delft University of Technology. Professor Nissen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, I uh, also read your uh, thesis with pleasure. Quite impressive, uh, the, the extent of experiments you did. Uh, I have a few questions. So the first is, about uh, how you came to this method and what was needed to really get it running. Because if I read especially chapter two, uh, the eventual approach consists of three steps, localizing the heart, segmenting the heart, quantifying the calcium. And it's almost post like you do it and you can apply it to many scans and it works. And in, in sort of a technical appendix, you indicate what settings you used. Mm -hmm. So. What is the story behind this? Was this really plug and play or did you go to many iterations to optimize the full chain and set all the hyperparameters? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for this question. Yes, so there, there were two steps. So the first step was that we had to decide on the structure itself. And um, when we started this project, that um, deep learning was really in the very early stages. Um, but still, uh, it is yet also um, quite new. So what we first did, we tried to produce a structure that um, mimics human um, human uh, tasks. That's why we had the three steps. Um, and that was the first step. And then choosing the hyperparameters, 
that's a trial and error. Yes. Um, over time, we got a feeling, for example, for the learning rate of a unit or of the units. So we, we got a feeling that we don't start it with a learning rate of 0 0.1. Um, but still, we, we, we basically did a hyperparameter search for um, 10 different um, uh, learning rates, for example, and um, also drop out. And all these layers, um, there were basically a lot of hours and weeks where the network was just running in the background on a machine and testing all the parameters um, to find the, the correct solution. And I'm afraid that uh, we are still, I think we would still need that if we if we train a new network now for a completely new um, problem, I think we still need um, a grid search for the parameters, yes. Okay, so so that, that there may be the potential to even further improve, but you, you get good results. But I was wondering if I look at those good results, are there really results in which you can state that you have looked at individual risk predictions in up to these 20,000 scans? Because in the end, the main evaluation is about an association uh, with uh, and, and, and putting someone in a risk category. So do you feel that you have validated your your method for individualized risk prediction or for risk stratification in groups? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes. Um, so in the publication, we mainly uh, show, yes, the, the risk groups. Um, we looked into individual cases during the training process and during the development process. Um, there we really, um, you know, uh, uh, tested a subset of, uh, let's say, 500 cases, looked at the, the outliers and really looked into them why this happened. And um, at some point where we decided, okay, that the network performs well enough, um, we then um, uh, just, um, well, at some point we had to accept that the network sometimes makes mistakes. Um, we will never get a perfect network. And then we applied it to the, the large uh, data set from NLST. And there we were basically unable to really look into individual results just because of the, the sheer number of the, of the cases. Um, yeah. yeah, and that would be my follow-up question. Shouldn't, you, you seem to have quite robust tools uh, now and a, a tool set, access to a large set of data. Uh, but but you but but you're try, trying you need to mimic what is around. Shouldn't be the next step to see whether you, you can yeah you know, put the threshold higher and improve risk prediction and get to much more individual measures. And what yes, would be needed yeah. for that? What are the challenges to get there? Um, yes. So that's uh, um, we are currently doing two different. Uh, Strategies. So the one thing is that we try to um, to uh, get deep learning into the next stages to predict uh, newer uh, biomarkers, for example, or newer decisions, um, maybe beyond uh, areas where human what a human can do. So that's the one thing. But on the other thing, we are also trying to really uh, mimic what humans are doing. Because I think one of the main challenges of getting deep learning into the clinics is not only that, uh, the, that we show that the network works. For example, our network we, we showed in 15,000 or 20,000 cases it works. But still, if we put that system into the clinics, the problem is um, a medical expert, a doctor, would maybe or most likely not trust that. Um, the, our our calculations, or at least not from the beginning, and also um, the patients would not trust it because they would say, "Well, it's a computer, maybe it failed." Or what that did the computer do? So we um, so we do these two really these two ways. One, we really try to understand what deep learning is doing because we think that's a very important thing, or maybe important task to get deep learning into the clinics, and. Um, Second, then we, we also try new things, but they are then even, even harder to, to explain why, why a decision was made. And, and then it's, it's, um, it will be very hard for a, 
for a doctor, for example, uh, make a decision based on a risk score from a from a model that. Uh, oh. You can finish your sentence. Yeah. Okay, um, from a model that we basically don't understand why it made this decision at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Zelesnik, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. And I would like to ask you and your company to await the results of our deliberations uh, upon our refer. And thereby, I adjourn.
Three, he present online, has assessed the quality of your thesis and of the defense you just gave. In view of its positive verdict and taking in it into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Arts is authorized, authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. Your supervisor now has the floor. Thank you, Prorector. Um, so dear candidates, uh, dear Roman, uh, I would like to start with a question. So do you promise to work uh, in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. Uh, so then by the authority vested in us by law, <clears throat> and in the conformity with the decision of the committee uh, here presented online, I hereby confer upon you, Roman Zelesnik, uh, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. Thank you very much. Uh, as evidence of this, <clears throat> I apologize. Uh, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the BO. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right. Um, it's really a nice honor. Uh, to stand here today and uh, talk about Roman. So um, he joined our laboratory at Harvard in Boston in 2016. Uh, before he joined us, he already had a very impressive resume with a master's in engineering from Graz University uh, of Technology in, in Austria, as well as an internship at the prestigious uh, MIT University, which is also located in Boston. Uh, in our group, he started as a research associate uh, working on the engineering side to develop uh, a data science analysis platform that we needed for our research. And from the start, uh, from really from the get go, it was clear that Roman was a very bright person and his work was of such a high quality that he was selected for a, a PhD track uh, within a shared program with Maastricht University. Um, of course, as was typical for Roman, um, you know, the first project he selected was a very large and hard problem um, that was very high risk, but could make a lot of impact if successful. So together with a group uh, specialized in cardiovascular imaging um, from our institution, we started to investigate if we could automate a very important clinical measure using deep learning. And as it was such a large project, with many data sets, many analyses uh, that needed to, perform, needed to be performed, it took several years before it was completed. Uh, from time to time, you know, this worried Roman, uh, but he persevered and kept going strong. So that was really good. And, you know, all the really hard work was worth it. Uh, Roman developed a great algorithm that worked very well, and the results were very strong. Uh, we were able to publish a study in a high impact journal, Nature Communications, and this work is also the centerpiece of the thesis he just defended. What's also interesting is that um, that work got a lot of visibility. So he was uh, selected as a top, uh, one of the top studies at the RSNA, which is a very large uh, radiology conference. So there he had to present before a very large audience, which he did flawlessly, um, as well as even talk to a panel of journalists about why AI, uh, his AI work was so impactful. Uh, he was immediately known uh, and a lot of people were referring to the Zelesnik study. So your name is now famous. Um, and during, his PhD, it was really nice to see how he expanded his skill set from a traditional computer science uh, to a medical data expert. So we learned a lot about medicine, clinical, clinical statistics, while still making sure that he kept track of the latest uh, deep learning technologies. Um, you could really just give him a problem, a, um, a potential uh, problem, clinical problem, and he could very quickly envision uh, solutions that could, uh, that could uh, address this. But he could also envision sort of the prob potential problems that could arise during these uh, analyses. So it's really good in, in having a very good helicopter view of uh, the projects. Um, it was really nice to see Roman in his role, uh, and he works uh, together well with a lot of uh, different people with a lot of different backgrounds. And it was clear to all of us that he was really enjoying this process uh, a lot. Uh, so. You know, this impressive skill set, together with this very nice and helping uh, personality, uh, quickly made him into a cornerstone in the lab. Uh, students liked to work with him, um, uh, as he was always there for them and willing to help. 
Um, he also made sure the new uh, lab members integrated well and found a, a nice home with us. Um, and there's also a very interesting story there. So one of the most extraordinary stories about this is about a friendship he made with uh, another lab member, Jakob, who's a German radiologist. So Jakob wanted to get married to his girlfriend, um, but uh, um, they had the issue that all the town halls were closed uh, due to the COVID pandemic. Roman, the nice person that he is, of course, wanted to help. And some, somehow he figured out that he could apply for a very special license uh, in Boston. Uh, and with this license, every layperson can marry someone, but only for one day and for one time. So sad and done, so he married them. And he's probably one of the very few people who actually got to do this without being an official. Uh, and I also think that he himself never expected him to do this. Um, um, so that was really nice. Um, it's also interesting that, you know, despite he uh, was in a medical environment, um, you know, very proud also with my background, that, you know, he kept a lot of personality traits often associated with uh, computer scientists. So he's a huge fan of, of Star Wars and all of uh, the computers are named after droids like R2-D2, um, as well as R2-Q5. I always get that one wrong, but I hope it was right now. Um, so, you know, that was really nice to see as well. Uh, all right, Roman. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, it's, and have you seen growing into a remarkable scientist? I am proud to have been part of your development, and I'm certain you will have a great future ahead of you, uh, whatever direction you want to pursue. Uh, with this, I would like to finish and ask the audience to give you a very loud uh, applause, something you really deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dear Dr. Zelesnik, also on behalf of the uh, Board of Deans and the whole academic community down here in Maastricht, I congratulate you with the honor that you just have acquired. I hope you perceive the change of the name in the subtitle of your image in the Zoom. Yes. Uh, we are very adaptive here. Thank uh, you very much. I would also like to extend the congratulations to the supervisory team. So that's uh, Professor Hugo Arts and Professor Udo Hoffman. Uh, congratulations with this uh, achievement, which is also partly yours. Um, and of course, there's a big team around you. I, I was impressed by the number of collaborators I saw on those prestigious publications. There's a whole team working with you, and I think everybody uh, deserves a little bit of the honor that we bestow upon you. Um, I, I personally, I enjoyed your presentation because this is not my cup of tea at all but you explained it to me in a way that I could really understand it and which also helped me to grasp the essence of the questions that were then asked. So, uh, which means that you're also a practical person um, in terms of marrying people, but also in terms of uh, <laughs> translating your knowledge to, uh, to laymen like myself. Um, I would also like to extend the congratulations to Oana, if I say this correctly, and to all the other persons that are very special to you. And finally, I would like to thank the opponents uh, who contributed today. I, I liked uh, the defense uh, because it was lively. And this goes especially, of course, to our guests of today, Professor Pekin and Professor Nisi. And by that, I would like to close this session. Um, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you.